he left. Yeah, I'm not like that. <laughs> he had to get you.
Um, basically, the format is uh, we've had four very rich panels yeah, before yesterday and also panels today, and there have been so many presentations, uh, papers. Uh, of course, you know those of us who are who are ourselves part of uh, paper presentation uh, panels and so on. We've actually read the papers, but not everybody else. But uh, we want to, uh, Vivian and I want to uh, take this forward, and uh, hopefully there'll be a within uh, not too long uh, in the future will be a volume uh, of essays with uh, um, the people who are here publishing their pieces as chapters and uh, uh, that will provoke uh, hopefully further uh, conversations. But for us now to sort of uh, uh, make sense of uh, many of the issues that arose and also to sort of put it, put it in the context of uh, how land should be governed, you know, the question, question of land governance has been in some ways been uh, the key issue that has come back uh, over and over again. Uh, we have uh, Professor Neil Brenner, from the professor from Harvard School of Graduate School of Design, and uh, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, the professor at the University of Los Angeles. Okay. It's been a, a really productive and long day, so I hope that we'll be able to pull up some kind of conversation here. And uh, what I thought, well, first of all, I want to say that it's been a great day because uh, well, you guys have managed to put together a really unique group of people coming from academia, from all kinds of different fields, uh, geography, sociology, law. And for those of us who feel in any given field marginal, right? This is like a group of people who are marginalized in other fields but feel mainstream at this particular uh, meeting. So it's great to be in here. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try to fulfill my role of being a commentator, but in order to raise three issues that I see as salient and as uh, of need for further theorization and discussions, I want to tell you briefly where I'm coming from. Um, I'm involved in this uh, multi-year project on uh, mining and natural resource extraction in the Amazon region, uh, Peru, uh, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, and Brazil. Uh, and the context in which in this, uh, I'm doing this research is one in which, um, <coughs> as you all know, we just finished uh, last year the, what's called the mineral super cycle, meaning a 10 year period of skyrocketing prices for commodities, especially uh, minerals and, and oil, uh, that was not seen since the gold rush of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, that created an immense amount of pressure over territories that had been uh, left alone for until very recently. And those territories are the ones that I'm looking at. In, in Latin America, this has happened in a very interesting political context. A colleague of mine at the uh, University of Buenos Aires, Maristela Bampa, has called this the commodities consensus. Right? She's, of course, playing with the idea of the Washington Consensus because the commodities consensus is actually bringing together governments of the right and the left. Right? Because you have both countries, like my own country, Colombia and Peru, uh, which have been governed by the right of center uh, parties, but also countries like uh, Bolivia and Ecuador and Venezuela, whose wealth comes, of course, from oil. Right, come together around the defense of big push towards those territories in order to uh, mine them and to explode them for oil. And all of that as part sort of, the, of the rise of a new developmental uh, project that uh, resonates with those failed projects of the 1960s and, and, and earlier, which give rise, and this is where um, I, I'll um, explain a bit more. Um, because this is what really relates to this conversation. This is the notion that I'm using, this, uh, what, I, what I call social minefields. Meaning places like this one. Uh, the Belomonte Dam, this is all in the Brazilian Amazon. You may have heard about this, at least the lawyers in the room, because this was the, uh, the case around which Brazil threatened to leave the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Meaning that the Inter-American Commission there ask uh, uh, Brazil to stop the construction of this particular dam, which is to become the third largest in the world. Uh, 
because Brazil had not complied with its duty to uh, consult with the indigenous peoples in the, in the territory. But Brazil said, well, Brazil drew the line at that and said, well, if I have to consult, I would rather leave the OAS and pull, and pull the ambassador and behave pretty much like the regional superpower that it's, that it's become. So that's one of the case studies in the, in the book manuscript that I'm wrapping up. Second uh, field uh, site that I'm looking at is the Sarayaku uh, indigenous people. These are all indigenous people's uh, territories. And again, in the Amazon, but in the Ecuadorian side, uh, in which again elected government, uh, uh, Correa's uh, uh, Ecuadorian uh, government, uh, allowed all exploration to uh, proceed without first consulting with indigenous peoples. Um, in, the, in the territory. Again, it was the Inter-American Court that stepped in and ruled in favor of the Saria to be um, into, uh, last year, actually. Uh, and finally, I won't go into the details of this third study because it's, a, it's another dam in Colombia. This was the original case study, but the larger <coughs> idea that I'm getting at and trying to get at uh, with this research is uh, this idea of social minefields, meaning uh, the, the rise of um, territories that were originally uh, those in which indigenous peoples and black communities actually, in the case of the Pacific coast of, of uh, South America, were pushed towards in previous uh, waves of colonization. So in talking about the long red that Phil was referring to, these were the territories where they were pushed up. And these are the last frontiers of extractive capitalism which are now being uh, literally mined. Um, I'll, with that as a, as a background, I wanted to raise my three questions or three issues for conversation and discussion. The first, of course, is the issue of soil and subsoil. Because I'm looking at mining, because I'm looking at oil, I, you know, when uh, Neil uh, alluded to the volumetric notion of territorial land property, that sounded like music to my ears, because that's exactly what I'm trying to get at and what I think is left out in some of the conversations around land. Because in these particular cases, and in many cases around at least Latin America and Africa, which I've taken a look at, it's not so much, or, or not only, the governance of the land, but the governance and the property and the exploitation, quote unquote, of the subsoil. Right. Um, and I think that that by looking at simultaneously at the soil and the subsoil, we get at important governance and uh, political mobilization uh, issues and questions. On the governance side, there's an interesting tension and, 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 and comparison between um, common law systems and civil law systems, meaning that in Latin America, what's been happening, of course, is that we inherited this tradition of the soil being the property of the owner, the person who owns the land, but the subsoil always belonging to uh, the nation state. So in more recent cases that I'm, uh, I'm active in more as a human rights lawyer, what's happened is that local communities, and not always indigenous communities, but also peasant communities, have rebelled against the nation state. For example, just recently, uh, against the nation, the, the Colombian state, granting alliances to Anglo Ashanti to uh, to open up what would be the, the largest open pit uh, gold mine in, in, the, in the Americas, right? What, the, what this particular community did was call, uh, call a vote on the project. And they said, well, do we want this project in our territory? And they said, no. Uh, and they went through the whole procedure that the Constitution of Colombia, which is pretty participatory, pretty democratic in nature, uh, uh, created for those purposes. And they created a stalemate. Now the government doesn't have any idea what to do because it's unprecedented. The government, of course, is asserting its right to exploit the land, to license uh, that, that particular territory for gold mining. But the now that, that idea, which is called popular consultation, is spreading like fire in other communities. So what you have is a, a bunch of different consultations leading to votes with the support of local mayors uh, that are resulting in votes against coal mining. So Anglo Gold and the state uh, on the one hand, and local communities and local authorities on the other hand, are a loggerheads over these, over these uh, uh, projects. And of course, the issue here is gold versus water, uh, agriculture versus mining, 
which is a, a defining issue again in many places in, in Latin America. So first issue, um, a, sort of a, a call for thinking simultaneously about soil and the soil. Uh, second one, the second one is uh, an issue that has come up repeatedly over the uh, last day and a half, which is democracy. Right? The relationship between the quality of democracy and the quality and consequences of governance over land. And I was reminded of, of uh, Berle Kinkenborg's uh, review of the, late, of the latest uh, Bill McKee book in the New York Review of Books. And she said in the, I'm quoting here in, in that review that de-democratization is a nearly an effect of industrial agriculture. It is one of its tactics. Track the spread of factory farming and you'll find it where there are no zoning laws or when zoning and local control over land use have been deliberately weakened. So this is exactly what we see in many other places, in uh, the NGO slash think tank that I spent time working at the Justicia, we're trying to connect up with communities which are in the same situation that this community in the Anglo Bola Shanti uh, uh, area uh, uh, is, is located in Colombia basically trying to connect up those communities with communities in South Africa have gone through the same process and communities say in Indonesia that are trying to struggle against similar uh, projects. And in this, um, participation rights, and this, uh, my third one will be on human rights, so I'm, I'm uh, turning towards uh, human rights already. Uh, participation rights are key in, in my story, in my uh, study about indigenous territories in the Amazon, the key legal figure has been free, prior, and informed consent, which has come up again in many of the um, uh, presentations here. And, uh, and uh, what I've done in that particular process, look at the effect of the usage of free, prior, and uh, informed consent and consultation by indigenous people. And, and you know, the empirical record, what it shows is that that particular figure has been able to slow down uh, the, uh, the onslaught uh, and, the, and um, um, the expansion of the agribusiness uh, project and the mining uh, concerns into the Amazonian territories, right? It, it, it hasn't been able to stop uh, that, uh, those projects. But it's, uh, it has certainly been helpful for slowing down uh, what would have, would have otherwise been uh, um, a bulldozer, right? Basically mowing down any resistance to those projects in, in, in the Amazon uh, region. Um, and finally, that already suggests some of the potential and some of the limitations that I see in the human rights framework. And many of us here sort of where one of, one of the hats that, that we wear is uh, as human rights advocates and human rights lawyers. And so what I would argue in favor of human rights has already been said by uh, Illumin and by Olivier uh, at several junctures, uh, is that you know, there is a rich uh, tradition of socioeconomic rights being used at the domestic level pretty effectively by communities that have been talked about in, in, in this uh, um, conference. Uh, for instance, in Colombia, uh, the major case, the most ambitious case of the Constitutional Court has been around IDPs. Right? So 10-year project, a 10-year uh, follow-up process, pretty much along the lines of the Indian uh, supervisory jurisdiction idea in which the court stepped in to protect not only socioeconomic rights, but also civil liberties of the almost 5 million IDPs uh, in Colombia. And likewise, one can uh, quote uh, cases from South Africa or from the Inter-American Human Rights Court. And, and importantly, some of the key cases, some of the key uh, services that the human rights discourse and the human rights machinery so speaks that has served to the communities of landless peasants, of, of working class uh, uh, rural people uh, that June uh, referred to, it have to do with first generation rights, with civil liberties, right? For example, the right to protest, the right to mobilize is absolutely key because uh, one of the ways in which many states have pushed back against the uh, mobilization of uh, landless persons of the MST and many other movements is by criminalizing that type of process, right? So that's key. 
Now, having said that, I was going to I went to wrap up with three caveats and one three limitations that I see in my own practice and and in, in my empirical research. One is the issue of impact, right? The lawyers, and this is where social scientists, are, you know, bring a, a healthy dose of, of skepticism to the human rights discourse, is to ask about the actual impact on the ground, whether or not framing discourses in terms of of uh, framing the uh, causes in terms of human rights uh, um, promote or uh, hinder uh, progress in, uh, in, in, in these type of causes. And you heard from Duncan yesterday a very skeptical note on, on that, uh, which I'm skeptical of his skepticism, but, uh, but not completely, I'll say why in, in a moment. Finally, um, there's this risk that I'm sure that uh, you and Olivier are well aware of, of the disconnect between what goes on at the, you know, the human rights uh, official venues at, at the UN, at, even in, at the national court, international courts on the one hand, and what happens uh, on the ground and the kind of mobilizations that were talked about in the previous panel. Uh, we have here two very unique people who have sort of have divided their lives and have split their lives and, uh, so that they are, have a presence in both places, Milun and and Olivier. But that I can say, having met many uh, rapporteurs and many members of, of committees and many experts, independent experts, that that's, that's not always the case. And even with NGOs, uh, Geneva based NGOs tend to be far removed from what goes on uh, on the ground. And finally, on, on violence. So if one accepts, right, and one is aware of these limitations, I, I think we're, many of us are aware of them. Well, what about violence as a, as a strategy? Uh, you know, I come from Colombia, so I know what living in a violent country is like. Um, so what I agree with Duncan, that that's a strategy that, that's always uh, available and maybe and sometimes the only strategy available to uh, dispossess the uh, social groups. I think we have to be aware also that these types of victimization, meaning that the forced displacement uh, of indigenous peoples in the Amazon or land displacements in, in the palm oil uh, growing regions, they have been subjected to particular, particularly vicious forms of violence. Right? So getting the work with all, being able to counteract with violence or with any other tool is a huge challenge because we're not in the situations, usually at least in these cases, in the situation that uh, Duncan was referring to in which you have uh, slum dwellers that uh, are effectively organized around a particular cause. But in the cases that, that I've studied in Colombia, what you have is five million people being pushed uh, to the uh, urban slums and basically hiding from each other, from everywhere, everyone else, because they're afraid of anyone recognizing that they have been pushed out of their urban land because that puts their lives in, 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 in danger. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop there. My time's up. So um, thank you for including me in this conference, um, and it's also wonderful to be on a panel with Cesar. We know each other from way back when I was a newly minted assistant professor of sociology at NYU, and Cesar was doing his um, a degree in law and society, so we haven't seen each other in quite a while, and now we meet up here on the podium, so that's very cool. So um, I am interested, I come out of a tradition of kind of radical geography, radical urban theory, social theory. And I'm interested in getting clear about the concepts that we use to think about space and spatial transformation. And so I'm kind of just reacting here to the conversation so far. Um, I've really learned a lot from this discussion, um, particularly from the kind of very intricate, at least for me, very intricate legal discussions um, in this conference. And as an outsider to that, um, to that conversation, I've learned a lot about things that I care about. So, as I understand it, the problematique, the general issue here is the global commodification of land. And in that context, we've been discussing quite a bit about property law. So, it seems to me that the, just simply the phrase global commodification of land 
opens up some fundamental questions about what exactly are we talking about? What do we mean global? What do we mean land? And what do we mean commodification? So my kind of reactions here to the discussion are intended as an attempt to contribute towards our collective effort of getting clear about those theoretical categories that we're presupposing. Because I think we need theoretical clarity in order to confront the empirical challenges and indeed in order to confront the political challenges that are being raised in this discussion. So first, so three comments and then a few maps just to kind of um, maybe clarify, maybe confuse. You'll have to be the judge of that. So the first comment is, um, so this conference is in part an exploration of the interplay between law and political economy. And that's a very challenging thing to connect. And in some ways, I think that um, the political economy analysis dropped out of the picture.